Hello, everybody. This is Thomas Beuter from Hawkstrite. I would like to welcome you to this webinar on the Hill RBF3 method. Uh, we are having two very dedicated presenters tonight. We have Warren Hill and Hadi Kierbo. Let me introduce the two gentlemen quickly. Dr. Hill has been in private practice in Arizona for more for the past 35 years doing referral anterior segment surgery. He's best known for his work helping physicians obtain the best possible accuracy for IOL power selection. His many IOL power collection websites are some of the best popular resources in the ophthalmology, in ophthalmology with a combined total of 1.4 million visits for each year. Dr. Hill has published extensively, serves as a visiting professor at numerous universities and is an adjunct professor of, of, of ophthalmology, I'm sorry for that, at Case Western University. He has delivered 32 names in lectureships and has presented 870 presentations at both national and international meetings in 47 countries. Welcome, Warren Hill. Dr. Hadi Kierbo is the medical director of the Swedish of the Scandinavian Eye Center in Copenhagen. He also acts as a consultant at the ophthalmic department of the University of Copenhagen. Dr. Kierbo performed surgery all around the world from USA to the Caribbean, South America, and in India. He's also published in the Journal of Cataract Refractive Surgery and trains young, of, young ophthalmologists in the skills of cataract surgery. Good evening, Hadi Kierbo. So please join Dr. Hill in North America and Dr. Hadi Kierbo in Denmark to learn more about version three of Hill RBF, exclusive the part of Hawkstride Landstar software. Dr. Hill will explain how artificial intelligence is used for IO power selection and demonstrate the improved refractive accuracy of version three. Dr. Kierbo will share the accuracy of his refractive outcomes based on artificial intelligence. So welcome everybody and please warn it's your word now. Okay, well, thank you very much. And a, a big thank you to Hogstrike for the invitation to share with you what I think is some, some pretty exciting developments in the area of intraocular lens power calculations. And right now it's a, no mystery to anybody that artificial intelligence is working its way into pretty much everything that we do. And Iowa power calculations are really no exception. Hard to imagine, but we're already up to version three of the RBF method for lens power calculations. And what we're gonna to do today, is I'm gonna give you some background as to how this works, how it was developed, and where we're going in terms of accuracy and the range of uh, calculations that we can do with this. So really as uh, anterior segment surgeons for, for really any given surgical plan, how can we really be the most effective? In other words, what do we want more than anything? Well, we wanna avoid complications. And when we think about complications for cataract surgery, you know, the, the standard list comes up, you know, posterior capsular tear, vitreous prolapse, IOP spike, perhaps a dislocated IOL, CME, retained lens fragment, TAS, heaven forbid, up, end up the Midas. But, but when you think about it, an unanticipated refractive outcome, a small or large, is really the most common complication following routine cataract surgery. Now, fortunately, most of the time, this doesn't result in a lens exchange. But if you think about it, it's the one place where we probably have uh, the least confidence with current technology. So said another way, it's pretty much the elephant in the room. And that elephant in the room every time we go into the operating room is IOL power selection. So as anterior segment surgeons, we are primarily being judged by our patients and our peers by our refractive outcomes. So what are some accurate accuracy standards and uh, should what's most common be good enough? And I'm here today to tell you that it shouldn't be. So let's look at uh, five uh, uh, well-known studies. There's the National Health Service study by Gale and his group, the Hahn study in the Journal of Ophthalmology, the Swedish Registry study in uh, Journal of Cataract Refractive Study, the Kaiser study in Ophthalmology, and then the Haggis Formula Optimization Database, which now is up to about 300,000 eyes. For the half diopter accuracy, things kind of settle around 78%. For the one diopter accuracy, about 98% is what we're seeing. And for those of you that take the time to track your outcomes, this number 78% should seem very, very uh, familiar. And in some ways it's a limitation of technology, 
and in other ways it has to do with how we do the measurements. So right now in the year uh, 2021, this is the gap that we're looking to choose, or close rather. If we drill down just a little farther in the Haggis Formula Optimization Database, really less than 1% of surgeons are at 92% for the plus or minus half diopter accuracy. About 6% of surgeons in that database are at uh, 84%. And as I mentioned, the vast majority are about 78%. So graphically, if you look at a 78% accuracy, it looks like this. And if we're re implanting you know, the Restore or the, the Symphony or Torque IOLs, I think we need to do a little bit better. I think we all would be in agreement in that regard. So let's, let's go back in history a little bit and talk about where we've been, and that way we can better understand where we're going. This is the, um, the original Virgin's formula, formula from the uh, German uh, mathematician Friedrich Gauss from 1840. And as we all remember from our, our training as ophthalmology residents, the object virgins plus the lens virgins equals the image virgins. So fast forward to a few years ago, <clears throat> and this is your typical Iowa power calculation formula. And it should look familiar. Lens virgins equals image virgins equals object virgins. It's still a Gaussian formula. Now, the problem with this type of formula is that the power of an intraocular lens within the eye is relative, not absolute. So if you have a 21 diopter lens and it sits closer to the cornea or more posterior from the cornea, its relative power changes. We know that as the effect of lens position. And the main difference between most virgins formulas is how they determine the effect of lens position. So the corrective estimation of the effect of lens position is one of the main determinants of Iowa power calculation accuracy. Now, some of the more recent uh, virgins formulas like Graham Barrett's universal two formula really do a very good job with this. But his formula is more like a calculation method um, than, a, than a regular formula that you could you know, write down on a single piece of paper. The older formulas from the, from the 90s and early 2000s really fall short in the estimation of the effective lens position. And as we all know, the effective lens position can only be estimated. It can't be accurately calculated because it's based on things that are unknowable. So that's a, a real limitation for lens power calculations. So just by way of demonstration, here's a database of about 3,400 patients. We'll use the SRKT formula. There's our half diopter accuracy. There's our accuracy outside half diopters. And again, you know, uh, half diopter accuracy in the 70% range, you know, 70 to 80% is very, very common. Now let's just take that same database and we're gonna fit it to an artificial intelligence model. There's our half diopter accuracy. These are the cases outside. So you can see that just that exercise alone demonstrates the, the amazing um, versatility of this, this particular approach. <clears throat> so what we're gonna talk about today is pattern recognition by artificial intelligence. It's one of many forms of artificial intelligence that we can use. And really artificial intelligence is everywhere. Um, I don't think you can get through three or four hours of your day without artificial intelligence impacting part of what you do. And think about when you got your iPhone, you took it out of that white box from, from Apple. And one of the first things it asked you to do is to show it your fingerprint so it could recognize who you were. So you put your fingerprint on the, on the home button and you did it a couple more times and it would gather more and more information. And basically what it was doing was it was taking your fingerprint pattern and it was assigning all the metrics to it that are used for identification. So this is a form of pattern recognition that's at least in our society is almost ubiquitous. The pattern recognition is used in medicine as well. Um, if you think back to when you were a resident or an intern and your attending asked you to identify a rhythm strip, you know, you would look at it and you'd be looking at a pattern. Um, and we had, you know, atrial fibrillation and bundle branch blocks, all this sort of stuff. Well, here's a, here's a V3 lead from a patient who has something called T-wave alternance. And T-wave alternance is a millivolt variation in the bottom of the T-wave from one um, beat to the next. 
And if that variation is more than a very, very tiny amount, <clears throat> it can be a marker for sudden cardiac death. So now our, our very sophisticated EKG machines are interpreting rhythms using artificial intelligence. So let's, let's get down into things that are a little bit more complicated and I'll show you the basis for what we do for lens power calculations. <clears throat> so here we have a box and inside this box are 1000 seemingly random input vectors using something called a Manhattan distance generator. And a Manhattan distance generator um, generates points as though you were driving across a city, Manhattan for instance, but you couldn't go through the buildings, you had to go around the buildings. So it kind of looks like a stepwise uh, pattern. And these points were put inside that box using the Manhattan distance generator. So here we have a, say a schematic of a, of a city. And this would be the Manhattan distance with us driving around the buildings. And this would be the Euclidean distance with us flying as the crow or the bumblebee flies. So for this exercise, we're gonna give the uh, artificial neural network 5,000 tries to come up with the underlying pattern. So here we are at about 120 cycles, uh, a little bit more, about 500 cycles. And by the time we get to 5,000 cycles, we've actually uncovered the underlying pattern of all these little dots inside the box. So think of the, the enormous power of this technology to recognize patterns and relationships that normally would be invisible to just the casual observer. So why not Iowa power? Well, um, using pattern recognition for artificial intelligence has some amazing advantages. First, it's, uh, it, uh, it's highly sophisticated and it can do outcomes optimization based solely on data. And as we all know, manual optimization uh, methods limit possibilities to what we already know. You know, we know what we know and we move in that direction. And sometimes we need something that's completely new to take us in a different direction. And this is well suited to real world problems where ideal models are not available. And IOL power calculations is the poster child for this sort of situation. It's also self-organizing as we just saw. It has the ability to create uh, novel, unique representations of the data and has very enhanced sensitivity for identifying and uh, unraveling complex nonlinear relationships. And it's free of calculation bias. If you think about the number of possibilities we have for eyes of pretty much uh, the, the range of human anatomy for axial length, central corneal power, anterior chamber depth, it's about 680 million com combinations. And no virgins formula, no regression algorithm is gonna be able to do that. So we need to move to a higher level of mathematics. So let me walk you through how we develop a, re a real world artificial intelligence calculator the steps that are involved and then where this has taken us. So first question is what measurement should we use? Well, of course we should probably use the axial length and anterior chamber depth, central corneal power, but are there other things that matter? Are there other relationships of which we may be unaware? And uh, we start out by um, taking 13 different measurements and Doug Koch and, and, and Lee Wong at Baylor University um, and I um, came up with 13 different measurements. And it's the usual things, plus things like a six millimeter spherical aberration, you know, gender, age, a, a number of things. And we wanna see, we'll throw them in the hopper here and we'll see which one works best. And we use a genetic algorithm, algorithm which em employs principles of a evolutionary iterative factor selection process. So we, we make a basic model and we modify this in our semi-random uh, fashion creating new models. And then the best for performing models are identified, uh, retained, and ranked. And we do this again and again and again. And with uh, today's computers, you can, you can do this uh, at amazing speed and at amazing depth. So the pro process gets repeated and repeated. And then we identify which factors are most important. And of course, the axial length is you know, one of the most important, the central corneal power, the anterior chamber depth. But we also found that the, that the outcome turned out to be very important and for a given IOL power. And as we looked at these uh, 13 different factors and went through them um, extensively, we found that the, again, the axial length, central corner power, anterior chamber depth 
the refractive outcome and the given IOL power were really what we needed. And we could fit this data set to almost a 98% accuracy. We also held out 20% of the cases and then ran them through. These are cases that were naive to the process of making the calculation. And that accuracy was at 90%. So what that told us was that we were on the right track and we were moving in the right direction. So during the process of evolving this, we can, we can look at different uh, markers for how well we're doing. This is early in the process. This is called an optimized response surface model that's used in, in uh, engineering. And you can see that uh, you know, there's some, it's got a sort of a lumpy bumpy appearance and we needed to make some, some, some improvements. And as we went through different <laughs> methods of using artificial intelligence, you can see that it evolved and evolved and evolved and the accuracy got better and better until we had almost a perfectly smooth optimized response surface model. And for this, we used radial basis functions as the activation function of the artificial intelligence algorithm. So next we need to fit real world uh, big data to the artificial intelligence model. So we know, we know what we need um, as, as far as factors, and now we need lots of data. So the way we do this is we ask our ophthalmic colleagues around the world to help us. And here we have 44 participants in 24 countries in North America, South America, uh, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, India, Asia, and Australia. And these are um, volunteers who very generously uh, have donated uh, their time and their cases. And many of these physicians represent some of the most accomplished uh, cataract surgeons in the world and certainly for their respective countries. So we're very grateful for their, uh, for their help and continued uh, support. So how do we make a calculator? Well, basically we, we have our data now and um, we, we know what we want to use. So we develop this organized pattern of data. We run it through the artificial intelligence uh, algorithm and apply our activation functions. In this case, it's a radial basis function. It's just a, it's just a method. It's an engineering based statistical model that allows us to come up with the right answer. And we have lots of options. We can use Gaussian process methods, uh, Krieging stochastic process methods. This just happened to be the one that worked best for us. Uh, we calculate the difference between this output layer and the fitting data set. And then there's a backward propagation phase where we can run things through again and again until the accuracy uh, doesn't improve. And then from this, we can develop um, a calculator. Now, this is from a, a very early effort of about eight or 900 cases. We were able to take a cloud of data and turn it into a straight line. And as we look at our half diopter accuracy, first thing we noticed was that there was no calculation bias. It doesn't matter if it's a long eye or a short eye, a bizarre anterior chamber depth or anterior segment values, it's simply a pattern. So one of the problems with Gaussian methods was completely leapfrogged over. Um, we, we could get straight to the answer by pattern recognition. And another tool that um, engineering has taught us, and it's never been used in ophthalmology before, but we decided to use it with this, is something called the boundary model. And for any pairwise model, in, in this case, this is central corneal power against axial length, we can create a boundary model where we sample the edge for known accuracy. And in this case, this is the 90% accuracy a boundary model for, for the keratometry and axial length. We can identify those cases that are outside the boundary model. And what this means is that a case with this data point, if, if that patient had this data point, we couldn't predict the accuracy at a 90% level. 90% is an arbitrary value, but it was way above what anybody had ever seen before, and it seemed to make sense to us. So once we had version done, uh, version one finished, uh, based on 3,400 cases, we decided to do a prospective evaluation. And um, it's 459 cases from three study centers. These are consecutive surgeries, no editing, um, wide range of IOL power, um, axial length, anterior chamber depth, central corneal power. And what we found was pretty much exactly what we predicted, that for all eyes, we were about 90%. And, and using the boundary model, that's, that's what it predicted. For normal eyes, a little bit better. Axial myopia, of course, is always going to be better because the lens power is, is very small and variations in, act, in effective lens position don't matter as much. 
And a big surprise was axial hyperopia. 84% um, for, for axial hyperopes is very, very high. And this was very encouraging early on. So this was back in 2006, almost four years ago. Other people um, began to evaluate what we did. This is Roman's group from 2017 at ASCRS. And you can find that you can see that when you use the cases that are have an inbounds calculation, you got exactly what we got. So it, it, it holds up. So let me just share with you how these boundary models work and how this has an impact on how you will use the RBF formula in daily practice. So this is version one, again, based on about 3,400 cases. We're gonna take a, an eye that's a little bit of an axial uh, myo, but some normal Ks and normal anterior chamber depth. And you can see that for the six pairwise boundary models that we use to generate an inbounds or out of bounds uh, flag for the, for the user, we're right in the middle. We have, we have lots of data. We can um, predict that we're gonna have a good outcome. Now let's take an, un, an unusual case. Here's a, a very long eye and axial uh, myo, and we're gonna get some pretty, uh, pretty steep Ks. In fact, we don't have data for a patient like this, so it's out of bounds. We're gonna have a shallow anterior chamber depth. And we don't have data for this, so it's an out of bounds calculation. So for a very long eye, with shallow anterior chamber and very steep case, that's pretty unusual. And in the beginning, we, we didn't have enough data. We only had 3,400 cases. So let's go to version two. Version two was based on about 12,400 cases. And now we've expanded our boundary models, which means we can have um, improved inbounds calculations. We're gonna take a longer eye, 28 millimeters, uh, a long eye rather, 28 millimeters. And here's that very steep, um, cornea. This is the patient we looked at just a minute ago. And you can see that now it's an inbounds calculation. Our shallow anterior chamber depth now becomes an inbounds calculation because we have enough data to support the calculation for half diopter accuracy at a 90% level. So as we increase both the amount of the data and the quality of the data, the inbounds calculations increase as well. So let's turn our attention to version three. And that was released just last month. And we're very excited about this because this is the culmination of about two years of additional work uh, to bring the, the RBF calculation method to this level. So here's a, here's a boundary model set up for version number three. And we're gonna have a very unusual eye. It's an extreme axial myope, 32 millimeters, very flat Ks, very steep, a very deep anterior chamber. And take a look at, at all the data points. They're all within the boundary models. So we've expanded both the depth and the breadth of our boundary models. Now, Hogstrite has made available an online calculator with version three. This is art at rbfcalculator.com. It's open to anybody, there's no charge. And um, you can go to the website, you can click on, you know, what is this? And it will take you to an explanation of what it is we're doing. And then if, if you're as geeky as I am and you like to you know, get down into the math, you can, you can go to an explanation of exactly what's taking place. You can enter the calculator and through a really enormous generosity on the part of Hogstrike, they've made this available to users of all biometers, not just the LensStar. So if you have the, uh, um, the Movu Argos or um, Outmaster 700, the Tomei OA2000 or the LensStar, you can also use this and it will accept data from those. Put in the patient information, the, uh, the biometry and the target refraction, some information about the IOL, including its, um, its lens constant. And then what it will give you is a calculation with the inbounds or out of bounds calculations. And in this case, we're up to about 34 and a half diopters and we still have enough data to support that calculation. Okay. So as you uh, use a calculator, you may notice that for the exact same IOL power, some, some cases will give you an inbounds indication. Other cases will give you an out-of-bounds indication. <coughs> Excuse me. And it has to do with the data entered. Are these data points within the boundary models? <coughs> Excuse me. Our team has... <clears throat> optimized lens constants for most of the popular IOLs used in Europe, North America, Australia, India, and throughout Asia. 
and you can go to the website and it will give you optimized lens constants for all of these IOLs. <clears throat> so um, just a little summary, in March of 2018, we released version two. Again, that was based on about 12,000 eyes. We took the power down to about minus five using meniscus lenses, greatly expanded the boundary model as you saw. For version three, again, we've expanded the boundary model. We now reliably go up to 34 diopters and in some cases as far as 36 diopters. And we have improved accuracy for unusual anterior segments. And for this, you, you enter the central corneal thickness, the white to white, the lens thickness, and also gender. When you have large enough databases, you can begin to pick up subtle differences like this. And it turns out that gender actually does matter for a series of patients. And of course, a greatly expanded boundary model. Just an example of how much of an improvement version three is. Um, this is a very short eye. You can see for version two, the calculation, all the calculations are out of bounds. That's the red indication. All the calculations for version three are inbounds. For an extreme axial myope, only some of the calculations are inbounds. And now are, all of the calculations are inbounds. So we're seeing a greatly increased number of inbounds calculations. Prior to release, as is typical of Hoxtrite, um, we did a, a very extensive evaluation of this. And this is close to 10,000 cases from a number of our different study sites around the world. And what we found was that for most, for most databases, version three gave a one to 2% improvement in the calculation uh, accuracy for a series of patients. So adding the additional parameters and using this updated um, an artificial intelligence model with this expanded boundary model um, really does does make a difference. Now, one last thing to think about is uh, is something we we haven't really considered in the past, and our eyes from all ethnic groups the same, our Caucasian eyes and Chinese eyes the same, and it turns out they're not. And if you talk to people who implant premium IOLs in Shanghai or Hong Kong, Singapore, Taipei, uh, which with uh, you know, Chinese populations, um, they use different formulas than we do because the anatomy of these eyes are different. And anybody who's ever uh, practiced ophthalmology, say in Asia, knows about the incidence of ankle closure amongst Asian eyes. The anterior segments tend to be smaller and a little bit more shallow, and this influences lens power calculations. Now, unfortunately for the Chinese, all of the lens power calculation methods have been optimized based on European databases. And it turns out that, again, Caucasian and Chinese eyes may, may not be the same. And now we have the uh, mathematical tools with the increased sensitivity to be able to pick up these differences and start making calculators specific for certain population groups. We have a, a long range um, study underway um, in mainland China, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taipei. And we're collecting data and in the future, hope to have an artificial intelligence calculator specifically for the ethnic Chinese eye. So the future of ophthalmology is experiencing a, a convergence of technologies for Iowa Park selection accuracy. In other words, we're, we're getting better and we're getting better by different methods. We have ray tracing, artificial intelligence, intraoperative aberrometry, and really advanced versions formulas like the Barrett Universal 2 formula, which I think we all would agree uh, that for theoretical formulas, this is the very best. And uh, the method that gives the greatest sensitivity and flexibility is probably going to be the winner of the game, the one that does the best job. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that Hogstrike is, is strongly committed to research in this area. So we know that 78% is what's most common. And if you track your outcomes, this will be a number that will look very familiar to you. We know that 84% is acceptable. This would be the next tier up of physicians. But 90% um, or even better, 92% is actually achievable with these new calculation methods and also taking very good care uh, with your measurements for things like service optimization, validation criteria, et cetera. So once again, this is 78%. Um, this is 90%. Um, and the goal of the project such as this is to make it so we don't have to worry about the spherical equivalent. Uh, those of you who are as old as I am probably remember when we went from ultrasonography to 
uh, the measurement of axial length by optical biometry, we really stopped worrying about the answers, about the axial length. And my hope is that we can do that with IOL power selection as well. And that elephant that's in the room, you know, that's always with us and you know, always a concern, especially for unusual eyes, will eventually fade away and we can begin thinking about other things that are more important. So thank you for your attention. And uh, let me just briefly introduce uh, my friend, uh, uh, Hadi uh, Kerbu uh, from, from Denmark. And as mentioned, he's the medical director of the Scandinavian Eye Center in, in Copenhagen. And he's uh, uh, had five years of training as general ophthalmologist and also subspecialty training, cataract refractive surgery and also glaucoma. And these days there's kind of a convergence between glaucoma and cataract surgery. He's a consultant to the eye department at the University Hospital of Copenhagen. And he does about 3,000 um, you know, lens-based cataract surgeries per year and refractive procedures. Um, this is an enormous um, uh, surgical volume and, and we're very pleased to have uh, uh, Dr. Kierbu uh, share his experience with um, artificial intelligence. Okay, thank you. And I'll just get going with my presentation. Can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. I wanna uh, start by, uh, sorry, can you, is my mic on? I can't see that yes. here. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Hawks Wright for inviting me to share my experience uh, with the Hill RDF. Um, I've used it now for about three years and um, I'll just uh, go through, uh, through our experiences um, and our workflow. So uh, these are my disclosures. I have no financial interest in any of the products mentioned. Um, so the Hill RBF, um, as you've heard, um, there's some quite advanced underlying mathematics um, I have to admit, even though Warren has tried to explain these things uh, in detail, I haven't really fully understood um, everything. But um, to borrow uh, a point from Mike Snyder, do you really need to know the intricate details of a combustion motor to enjoy driving a car like this? Um, and I think not. And um, I think that's the same thing with the Hill RBF. As long as it drives and, and you're enjoying it, um, I think that's, that, that's what you need. Um, so, uh, so this is a, a method, a calculation method, right? It's not a formula, uh, purely data-driven by artificial intelligence. It's self-validating. It's the first method with quality feedback um, on the reliability of the calculation with the inbound and out-of-bounds statements. Um, it's constantly evolving, which is one of the key things I really love about this method. Um, as we've heard, um, the initial uh, version had around uh, 3,400 eyes. Version 2.0 was over 12,000 eyes, and now we have a highly refined data set of over 30,000, which is really, really impressive. Um, Sorry about that. So beforehand, we would use, uh, with the older uh, calculation formulas, we would use different um, formulas for different eyes. Um, short eyes would be one formula, long eyes would be a, di uh, a different one. Uh, with the Hill RBF, we know that it performs equally well in, in any eye. Um, so, like I was saying before, it's self-validating. And for somebody like me or my staff, it's, it's really, really um, safe to use because we, when we look at the printouts, we look at the, um, the prediction um, of the measurements and we get a, a quality measurement, which will say whether the measurement is inbounds or out of bounds. If it's inbounds, we know that with a very high probability around 90% will be within plus minus half a diopter. If it's out of bounds, which is gonna be very rare now, um, as I understand with the 3.0, um, we know that there's some very special things going on and we have to really uh, be careful. Um, so it's one formula for all eyes. Um, 
it improves the confidence in the prediction and we have a better safety with unusual cases. And that um, leads me to our experience and our workflow. So just to, to start from the basic, um, we do tear film analysis on all our patients and we optimize the ocular surface when needed. So we use artificial tears, lid scrub, warm compresses, and if there is um, signs of meibomian gland disease, we will use IPL as well. Um, we use the LensStar, obviously, and then we find that um, it's a very reliable uh, tool. It's really quick. It's a one-click uh, measurement that gives us a lot of data. Um, very closely spaced uh, ker keratomity spots, uh, commentary spots, sorry. Um, a very high precision on the biometry and a very uh, flexible um, measurement technique. So our staff is highly trained in validating uh, the measurements and uh, changing or re-measuring if needed. So when you uh, look at the measurements, so if you look at the biometry, you can see that uh, you have the different spikes um, and you can go in and move the calipers if you, if you need, if, if the quality of the measurement, measurement is not um, at par with what you want. You can uh, go in and remove any measurements you want to delete and then uh, uh, just sit back with the high quality measurements. Um, same thing goes, oh, sorry, this is the printout. And uh, this is where you see whether the measurement is in bounds or out of bounds. Um, so with white to white measurements, again, you can go in and move or resize the reticule. So you have a, a high precision. I'm sorry about the slides here. I don't know why they're running away from me here. Um, anyway, um, Again, with uh, keratometry, we have these um, uh, spots that we can, we can actually look at the actual quality of the measurement. And if it's a bad quality or unclear uh, spots, we can go ahead and, and, and delete and do new measurements and until we are satisfied with, with what we see. Um, so, uh, my initial results, these were back from 2018 when we had uh, our first 53 cases we looked at. Um, this was uh, uh, presented earlier. Um, we compared the Hill-RBF with the Olson formula, which was the main formula I was using at that time. And we can see that with the version 1.0 of the Hill-RBF, we had 83% uh, uh, within plus minus half a diopter. With the Olson formula, we hit uh, 78%. And then when we went to the version two, we uh, were over 90% within 0.5 of a diopter, which was actually the main thing that drove me towards using this formula as my main formula. Um, and that's how it is today. Um, we have now uh, looked at um, 671 prospective cases, and we are still over 90% within that uh, plus minus half a diopter, which is very satisfying for us. Um, and uh, it gives us great safety. Uh, our staff is uh, really, really happy um, when they get the patients in for the post-op evaluation. Um, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's overall very satisfying. Um, Good, so this, in summary, um, in our experience, the Hill-RBF calculation method is um, for all eyes, independent of its biometry. It improves our confidence with the calculation parameters with the in and out of bound statement. And it, able, it enables us to identify unusual cases at a glance and it's constantly evolving. So uh, this is, uh, still and going to be for a long time our uh, preferred method of iron calculation thank you very much so thank you. i guess um are we going to take questions now 
Any... Yes, we do take questions now, and I already have got a few questions here. So, um, I have one question. <clears throat> yeah. Sure. Thomas, before we get started, I'd like to make one comment. And I, I hear this from, from people who use the method. They say, well, what do you do when you have a, an out of bounds indication? And the first thing we do is we tell the patient, you know, Mrs. Jones, um, God has given you an unusual eye. You know, it's very short, it's very long, it has a very steep cornea, it has some unusual anatomy in the front part of the eye. And we're gonna to need to be extra careful with this eye. And so from the beginning, um, it's a heads up that there's something unusual about this about this patient. And that has enormous value for us as surgeons. We just don't do the calculation and then see what we get two or three weeks later. We can have a conversation with the patient prior to surgery. They know their eye is unusual. Uh, we may not get the, you know, the half diopter accuracy that we're looking for. And then maybe we might look at it with several other formulas perhaps. But now it's a partnership between you and the patient and they know that you know they may not get a you know, perfect outcome. I think that has enormous value um, as as we as surgeons um, you know try to you know do what's best for our patients and also help them understand what to expect. Yeah, good point. Thank you very much, Warren. There's one question um, from the audience and. When will we start speaking about 0.25 diopter accuracy? Okay, I can answer that question. This is this is something that has been coming up for a long time. And it, it, it began with eye wells and quarter diopter steps. One thing to keep in mind is that eye wall power selection is a multi-part process. We have keratometry, we have axial length, we have the formula, um, we, have a, we have a number of parts. And anytime you have a multi-part process, there's a paradox, there's a mathematical paradox that's involved. So let's say we're making a widget and the widget has a, a certain accuracy at the end of the production line. <clears throat> and the widget has five or six component parts. We can calculate what the accuracy will be for the end product by doing something called the square root of the sum of the squares where we take the accuracy for each part, we square it, we add them all together and then take the square root. It's a standard error analysis method. The paradox is that if you take one part and make it perfect, its contribution to the overall outcome is zero. But if you have one part and it's a problem, its inaccuracy is squared. So if you have a quarter diopter step IOL, that accuracy improved, but it didn't affect the total overall accuracy of a multi-part process. So in order to get quarter diopter accuracy, uh, what we know from error analysis is that every component part of a multi-part process has to be improved. And we're getting so good at eye well power prediction now that we're going to need to turn our attention to the measurement process. And I think one of the noisiest aspects of lens power calculation is keratometry. And as we get better with keratometry, I think our accuracy is going to get up. Get, get better and better. And I think when that happens, industry will respond by giving us IOLs either with the exact power labeled on the box or in quarter of after steps. And we can all understand why they're reluctant to do that. It's kind of an inventory nightmare for them because they don't have to double the amount of IOLs available. We have to, we as the physicians and as the investigators have to prove to industry that we have the capability to be accurate enough for it to make a difference. And I think we're right on the threshold of being able to do that. And I think the next generation of biometers is going to give us that level of accuracy. And this, this will be a complete game changer, but we have to do our part and then industry has to do their part. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Rosh Warren. There's another question from the audience. Is there any difference in results when comparing the measurement devices? Well, the, again, I'll answer this question. The, um, the RBF method was optimized for the LensStar. And the reason the LensStar was chosen was the keratometry is probably some of the best in the business. You have 32 measurement points. If you look at the Almaster, say 500 and earlier, you have six measurement points, three above and three below the horizontal meridian. This has 32. 
So the Ks for the, the Lenstar are, are really very, very good. And, and that was one of its, uh, its best features. So I think because keratometry plays such an important role in accuracy, I think that the, probably the best results will be for the Lenstar for that reason and also because the, the method was optimized for the Lenstar. But it still gives very good outcomes for, for other devices as well. And that's why we included that um, on the online um, calculator. Thank you. Another question from the audience. How far are you in calculating post-LASIK eyes? Okay, this is, this is a question we get all the time. The problem with the post-LASIK eye is measurement accuracy. Remember when somebody's had LASIK, PRK, ALK, radial keratotomy, we can't measure the cornea because the ghoul strand ratio is different in different ways in different places. So if you look at the central three millimeters of somebody with early generation LASIK, the, the measurement error is, is completely different at the corneal vertex, uh, two millimeters out and three millimeters out. One of the basis, basic concepts of artificial intelligence is you need good metrics in order to generate an artificial intelligence model. And if we can't measure the cornea, we can't do the exercise. And every cornea that's had prior refractive surgery, we all know is unique and individual. So lacking the metrics, we can't do the exercise. Thank you. Another question from the audience. What about our ORA technology, so the interoperative aberometry? What do you think about that? Sure. Well, in, remember, we have to remember what interoperative aberometry is. There's no secret sauce with interoperative aberometry. It's an aphakic autorefractor. That's what it is. And so in the aphakic state, we measure the, the refractive state of the eye, and then the eye well power is calculated using a virgence formula at an assumed effective lens position. Now, the, the advantage of intraoperative aberometry over a regular virgence formula is that you're adding power to an existing optical system. So there's a theoretical advantage for that. Where intraoperative aberometry, I think, works pretty well is for the toric IOL. Because with the toric IOL, these are relatively small power differences, and you're, it's a net solution of the anterior cornea, the posterior cornea, and the alignment and toricity of the eye well. So for figuring out the toricity of a, of a toric eye well, I think interoperative aberometry does a very good job. But for the spherical power, I, I believe that artificial intelligence is better. Imagine if you were to do biometry on one of your patients with them laying down, having just made an incision on the eye, the eye full of viscoelastic and fluid flowing all over the cornea. I, I really don't think that's an optimal s situation for, uh, for, for measuring an eye. Whereas, you know, in, in the column of the office, the patient's sitting up, taking her time, optimizing the ocular surface, I think we can do a little bit better job. So remember, intraoperative aberometry is an aphakic autorefractor with a virgin's form. Um, there's one more um, question. Yes, sorry, just the point on the post-LASIK surgery, uh, Warren. Um, uh, wouldn't you recommend that, you know, you do your best with your measurements and then you go ahead and use the ASCRS uh, post-refractive uh, surgery uh, website? To yeah, that, that's, that's become a standard right now. And um, there are a number of methods on the ASCRS calculator that have evolved over time. Remember, we began this in 2007. So it's been, it's been a long time that that's been around. <laughs> and some of, the, some of the measurement techniques are, 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 are legacy techniques. Um, and for those of us who do a lot of these calculations in our practice, we see people from all over the country for these calculations. We've sort of migrated to the Barrett uh, True K method on the ASCRS calculator. So the, the website is iolcalc.ascrs.org. And the Barrett True K method for radial keratotomy, myopic LASIK and hyperopic LASIK, um, Adi, I think, or Adi, I think does a, does a very good job. And that's pretty much what we're using right now. Graham Barrett gets very high marks for developing that and then making it free and available to all of us. That's, that's really quite wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, since you just shared the, the link to the online calculator for post lazy guys, one question is also, what's the link to the Hill RBF online calculator? Sure, it's rbfcalculator.com. That's all there is to it. 
And again, it's uh, it's a it's a free offering by Hog Strike, which is uh, an act of enormous generosity, as far as I'm concerned. Any other questions, Thomas? Uh, there are no other questions in the in the queue, so I would like to thank you both for all the presentations. Oh, yes, Holly. Sorry, <laughs> there's there was as far as I can see, there's one question here I can see that says, uh, "Did you compare the calculations with the Kane formula?" Well, I, been, I don't I don't have access to the Kane formula, so I don't know. Kane formula is, from my understanding, it's machine learning, um, mm -hmm. and that's really all I can tell you. Yeah. Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> I wish you that's fine with me. Thank you very much. So thank you for all the efforts, for nice presentations. Thank you very much for the audience for being with us and for the good questions we got. So the webinar is also going to be online on the Hogstride web channels, on the YouTube channel, which we are going to have. And if you want to look at it again, just go there. There are other resources available there as well. And I wish you all a good evening or a good day for there in the world where it's morning. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.